On this edition of the Nesson Celtics podcast, we look at the Celtics' 5-1 and one start to the season, Gordon Hayward's impressive opening stretch, and a look toward next week, and, of course, the Celtics' recent haircuts. Let's get to it. Welcome back to the Nesson Celtics podcast. I'm your host, Chris Grenham, joined, as always, by Adam London. Adam? Celtics 5-1 and one, coming off a 119-113 win against the Cavaliers. Wasn't uh, pretty, I would say. Of course, Gordon Hayward had a tied his career high 39 points, so that takes all the headlines. But Celtics defense wasn't great after the first quarter, but Kemba Walker had another nice, quiet 25-point performance. I mean, they're riding a five-game winning streak into Charlotte. It's Did I miss anything? That's good, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you at this point with the Celtics, you say, yeah, yeah, it was the Cavs. But, I mean, with this team, you'll take anyone they can get at this point. In a game where they're, you know, everyone's meshing together, in a game where you can get Hayward to, you know, establish his confidence like that was huge. Yeah, I mean, let's start with Hayward. So he was, there's all those weird statistics coming out after the game where he was, yeah, he was 16 to 16 from inside the arc, which was, I think he was the first player to do that in the three-point era. I don't know, he's the first player to do it since Wilt Chamberlain when it was raining outside on a Tuesday and there was, oh, I don't know, yeah. six people in the stands. It was all those weird uh, narratives that people can throw out there. Either way, it was an impressive performance. The fact of the matter is his burst seems to be back, yeah. which I'm not going to go the whole is Gordon Hayward back route because like Brad Stevens has said, he was basically there entering the playoffs last year. I mean, against the Pacers in the first round, he was really good. He was really good in game one against the Bucks, like everyone else was, and then they all fell flat. So he kind of went with that. So I don't think it's as much of a question of, you know, is Hayward back? I think he's always, he, you know, he's, yes, he's back, if we're going to answer that. The fact of the matter is he's getting to his spots, even though it was against the Cavs, who are really bad defensively. The fact of the matter is if you can get to your spot, that many times like that's a really good sign yeah and it seems like what I'm hearing from Hayward and this is kind of how it goes in you know hot take culture it has to be one way or the other is people either declaring him you know fully back yeah or they're like you know he's still not like throwing it down like he used to in Utah and to those people I'm like why does it matter yeah yeah you know he's finding like crafty ways to get inside and he, he's creating separation and outside of Kemba, because, you know, Tatum sometimes still struggles with it here and there, is right. the Celtics just need guys in general who can go and get their own shot. Yeah. So if he's finding these avenues where he can do it consistently, two points counts as two points. I mean, it doesn't matter if he's throwing it down, you know, in a highlight reel dunk or, it's, you know, it's a crafty layup or floater. He's still finding good shots. Right. And, I mean, if I were to have told you, yeah, after the Sixers loss, which everyone assumed was going to happen, that Jalen Brown – eventually was going to get hurt over the next five games, and Ennis Cantor was going to miss the next five games, you would not have thought they would go 5-1, and one, right? So right. the fact that Hayward can be that secondary scorer alongside, or, you know, primary scorer, alongside Kemba and Jason Tatum, I mean, that's a huge, huge plus that they have other outlets to go when a guy like Cantor, when a guy like Jalen Brown is out of the lineup. I mean, there's three guys averaging 20-plus points. They're the only team in the NBA to do that right now. It's solid. And speaking of guys who they can fall back on, Daniel Tice has been pretty pretty good at that crazy 6'8 center position. Yeah, and we were talking about it the last show. It's just if you can get these, you know, 7 and 9, I think he was 5 and 9 yeah. against the Cavs, just five blocks, a solid just a block machine, yeah, 25 to 30 minutes. With, with how bad we thought their interior depth was going to be this year, you'll take that from Tice every single night. Yeah. And it seems like, I mean, you don't want to see a player benefit, obviously, when it's at the expense of another person right. being out because you want your full team to be there. But he's maximizing on this time that they're, you know, Tice is, I mean, Cantor is sidelined. And with each game, it seems like his confidence is growing. Yeah, he had four blocks against the Knicks, five blocks against the Cavs. Again, not the greatest of opponents, but the Knicks are a bigger team. Yep. And the Cavs, someone you got to deal with, like Tristan Thompson, who is an all-star when, come, when it comes to playing the Celtics. He just dominates the Celtics, crushed the offensive glass once again. But if you have a guy like Tyson there who can provide a little bit of rim protection, which surprisingly he has, he is still 
okay on the glass. He had eight rebounds, nine rebounds in the last two games. But you might elect to have him as the normal center at that rotating center position. You kind of bail on the glass and say, all right, whoever our opponent is that night is probably going to win the battle on the glass. But if we can get those 25 to 30 consistent minutes from Tice, who's quicker on switches than Cantor is, who's realistically, you know, relatively efficient, and he can provide that little bit of rim protection, that's probably the avenue Stevens is going to go, at least for now. Right, and if you look at it, how they are with Cantor out, I mean, Rob Williams gives you kind of all all in on the glass yeah. and absolutely kind of zero <laughs> finesse yeah, game, yeah, yeah. where Tice obviously has that, his game is uh, predominantly that finesse game, but right. he's, you know, he's showing that side of being able to stick his nose in there. You mentioned the Knicks. Say what you want about the Knicks. What they aren't lacking is just dogs. You know, yeah. they have Marcus yeah. Morris, they have Bobby Portis, those guys who... They're tough as hell. Right, and the fact that Tice was able to hang tough in, you know, a close game like that, was you got to be pretty encouraged by yeah, the, I the mean, Celtics. Yeah, I mean, that's a team that is bigger and longer than the Celtics. Yeah. And they're, no matter if the Celtics are 100% or not, even with Cantor, they're going to cause the Celtics problems. And that's definitely... That game in particular wasn't a game that they would have won... Last year, I mean, we'll we'll get to that game after we um, finish up talking about the latest win, the Cavaliers, and we'll kind of work backwards here. Um, going off of Hayward, another guy who was productive once again was Kemba Walker. He had 25 points on 8 and 19 shooting, eight rebounds, three assists. I know he gets to the line a lot. He only got to the line four, yeah, four times against the Cavaliers, so that helps him not as much when he only gets there four times, but helps him operate quietly but he had 32 going back over this win streak he had 22 against toronto 32 against the knicks 32 against the bucks 33 against the knicks and 25 against the Cavs. some of those were louder than others but like against the Cavs the other night all the focus is on hayward and all of a sudden you look up and he's got 20 and five it's you know again a lot of it has to do with his ability to get to the hoop but it's really impressive yeah and i think the biggest thing you saw with Kemba the other night was the game against the Cavs. You kind of seen that like that whole night the Celtics were up somewhere between like eight to like thirteen yeah. points. And given just the Cavs or the Cavs, you never really felt threatened. Right. And then you kind of looked up in those last couple minutes. You're like, are the Celtics about to blow yeah, this? They, yeah, they were. Yeah. And there was then, a split second where I thought they were going to lose that game. And then Kemba comes in late and just sticks that three where it's like, all right, this one's over. Right. And that's what you brought him in for. I mean, that he's the guy. Even with as you know Hayward's having his career night, Kemp is still the closer, and right. he's you know he's he's got the killer mentality. He stuck it, and he knocked down those shots at the end, and he iced the game. And that's yeah. the guy who you brought in to do exactly that. Yeah, hundred percent. And he's done that so far. Besides that season opener, he's really found his flow. Uh, Jason Tatum as well has been really good. He was not great from three. He was 0 for five against the Cavs, but he was nine to sixteen overall. So, I mean, 9 of 11 from inside the arc. He had 18 points, 7 boards. He's been another guy they can turn to over spurts when, say, Kemba's not in the game or Hayward's in the game. They're, with this lineup, I mean, there's not a ton of depth, and, and we can get to that too. There's clearly a depth problem on this team. I mean, Carson Edwards was great because he's good in Cleveland, apparently. Like, yeah. he, had, he had 13 points on 5 of 6 shooting the other night. But other than that, and prior to that game, no one on the Celtics bench can really score. You're not going to rely on Grant Williams or Brad Wanamaker to get you a consistent 10 points off the bench. So that's a problem. So I think for the most part, Brad Stevens is going to have to operate going forward with, all right, we've got to have at least one or two of our main guys on the court at all times. You're going to have to have Tatum, Hayward, Jalen, or Kemba out there at all times. And teams have done that before, but that's just, I think that's kind of going to be the method going forward here. Yeah, no, and I totally agree. And one thing I was encouraged by with Tatum against the Cavs was, you know, Tatum entered this season with obviously super high expectations and no one's impervious to the noise. And he obviously hears, you know, this is the season I got to step up. You know, they're really leaning on me. And for him not to force his way into a game where someone clearly just had the hot hands, you know, that was, it was this type of game where they kind of just let Hayward do his thing. And for the maturity of Tatum, be like, I'll knock down the shot when it, you know, when it comes my way, but I'm not going to let this guy, you know, I'm not going to 
knock him off his game. Right. I thought that was pretty encouraging. Yeah, that's a player. step forward. Especially There's, for a young player. Yeah, totally. And again, like a year ago, two years ago, he might have tried to assert himself into that game, and it's you know a good thing that he quietly didn't. He still got up 16 field goal attempts, so I think he's learning – that, yeah, I can still get my shots up without, like, really forcing myself into this one. Right, and Celtics fans are obviously well aware of Tatum's worked out with Kobe quite a bit, and that's also just vintage Kobe to, yeah. oh, it's like, oh, you're having a hot game? This I'm my game still now. Kobe Bryant, yeah. so I'm going to make sure I leave my print on this, this game. This is my game now. And, yeah, I mean, Tatum, 18 points, it's it's not, you know, it's not going to wow you, but right. they needed all of those 18 it's points. It's quality. Seven yeah. boards, too. I mean, there is, there is maturing there. There is... Uh, still plenty of work that has to be done on the defensive end. Like, for the most part, except for parts of the first quarter, the Celtics' defense stunk against the Cavs. Like, yeah. it was really bad. Switching hasn't been all that swift, uh, which is a, what they're going to have to rely on a lot because of their lack of size. And, again, you can get away with that sort of thing against the Cavs, which they almost didn't. But going forward, even against a team like the Hornets on Thursday night, they're not going to be able to get away with that. So they do need to make improvements on the defensive end, um, especially in the front court with guys like Robert Williams. Robert Williams, for the most part, has been good. Like yeah. there's no, there's no point in really nitpicking a guy in his second year with tiny little tweaks, considering the progress he's made. Like he has made tremendous fine tuning tweaks to his game from where we were a year ago at this point. But in terms of his positioning on the defensive end, there's a lot of work to be done there. But he's still been good. 15 minutes, he was 3 of 4, 6 points. Um, again, the positioning and that sort of thing can be can be worked on. But defense will need to be uh, improved. That was still the case against the Knicks as well. Jason Tatum, however, hits his first game winner over, you know, right, not over, it was over R.J. Barrett, next to Marcus Morris of all people, who's kind of like his guy here in Boston. That was That was pretty cool. I think there are two senses of irony. One, you mentioned the Morris factor. Two, we've talked about it, I think, in both episodes already. It's just so perfect he won a game with a long two. Yeah. Like, heels yeah. on the line. Yeah. No, but, I mean, that, like, that was a big – that was a grown man shot, you yeah. know, like inbound pass. And one thing I think Tatum already does better than a lot of guys in the league, his rip-throughs are quicker than – Yeah. And, you know, he, like, takes the inbound pass, gets right to his spot, puts it up. And that's something you're going to have trouble defend. One, not having quick enough tans. Two, fat guys are going to hack you a lot of times right. for doing that. So to be able to uh, step up on uh, step up on that moment was pretty cool. To see. Yeah, it was huge. And I mean, again, it's against R.J. Barrett, who is a rookie, but he's a bigger rookie, smarter guy. But again, like the fact that over an inexperienced defender like that, he created so much space in such yeah. a small amount of time. It's really, really impressive. Uh, I thought another takeaway from this game, again, the Knicks are 1-5, and five, so there aren't, you know, it, it's an interesting game to try and pull things from. They also didn't run horribly deep. They only worked three into their bench, and everyone except for Mitchell Robinson played over 20 minutes for the Knicks. But the fact of the matter is they were one of those strong, big, bully teams, and the Celtics were able to kind of battle through. That's a game last year. They for sure lose that game, right? like without question. So I thought that was a positive. Yeah, I think what we've seen already, what this Celtics team might lack in talent, and it's not like there's a dearth of talent by any means, right. but what they can make up for it is just grit. You know, yeah. they're not going to back down. Aside from that game, we saw it a few games before against the Milwaukee game. That's another game they pack it in, yep. last year's team does. So, yeah, this team's going to fight you uh, tooth and nail from till the final sound. So, speaking of fighting, now we can come back up to date. We're recording this on Thursday just before Thursday night's game against the Charlotte Hornets. So uh, there's a chance you're listening to this pregame. There's a chance you're listening to it afterward. Either way, the Hornets are a pesky team. Yep. They're 4-3, and three, surprisingly. I don't think anyone would have told you that out of the gates they would go 4-3 and three with games against the Pacers, the Warriors, the Clippers, Lakers, Timberwolves. Granted, those last three, they lost all three of those. But they have been pretty good. Terry Rozier has only been their leading scorer, I believe, in one game. So far, guys like Devontae Graham, guys like P.J. Washington, younger guys have really taken the reins. And Terry, don't get me wrong, he's, I think he's still their leading scorer in terms of averages. But, I mean, was he going to take like 40, 45 shots against the Celtics on Thursday night? I was thinking the best thing that can help happen to the Celtics, conversely, the worst thing that can happen to the Hornets 
is if Terry hits his first shot Thursday yeah. night. Yeah, If he game sees over. that shot go through his first one, he's going to be like, oh, it's Terry time. It's game over. And yeah. he, you, like you said, he might launch 40 shots. Yeah, he, I, he really could. And, I mean, Devontae Graham, so I was actually incorrect. Devontae Graham has played in all seven games, hasn't started one, but he's averaging 17.3 a game. Terry's at 16.9. So, yeah, Devontae Graham, another guard, Kansas guard, um, has been their top producer off the bench, but you're right. If that first shot goes through, it's completely game over, which is why plenty of Celtics fans kind of fell out of favor with Terry Rozier. The, the Hornets are a team that struggles in the front court. Guys, Cody Zeller, uh, guys like Cody Zeller, are people who they rely on, Bismack Biombo. I mean, the Celtics aren't terribly deep in the front court, but considering Ennis Cantor likely returns tonight for the first time since opening night, and the Celtics will be, quote-unquote, at full strength. Um, it probably doesn't serve well, at least on the glass, particularly the offensive glass, for Charlotte. Yeah, I think another thing that doesn't well, it doesn't benefit for the Celtics is, you know, they're coming off a game where there's was a lot of stuff you wanted to see, that big night from Hayward, uh, Kemba stepping up. I think tonight, and especially how hot they've the Celtics have been of late, where you're kind of looking at possible trap game territory. Yeah. Especially because you're about to go on the road and face a pretty tough Spurs team yep. after this. Say what you want about the Hornets. They're going to be motivated tonight. Terry's going to be motivated. I know Kemba will, but it's not a team that you can totally just, you know, pack it in against. Yeah, totally. And, I mean, they are, like you said, going up against the Spurs on Saturday at 5 o'clock, which is – tough game the Spurs are four and three but in a much tougher West they've got uh, LaMarcus Aldridge who gave the Celtics plenty of problems went for 40 plus one time uh, in one of the two games they played the Celtics last year DeMar DeRozan averaging 20.6 over their first seven games so the Spurs will create plenty of problems the Celtics wrap up that road trip after the San Antonio game but there's been plenty of like team bonding on this little road trip did you see they were at that uh, they went into like one of those escape rooms yeah together I've, have you ever been in one of those i haven't i've never been in one so i i it's a team bonding thing like a team building thing it has grant williams written all over it yeah like totally but i can't imagine a guy i, I don't know like that that was a grant williams force thing i would assume right. but i can't imagine a guy like kyrie irving or marcus morris going into an escape room with his no. teammates last year no with these guys too my when I saw that, I kind of went through each player and imagined how each of them might have handled it. Yeah. And just from the few clips I've seen online of Romeo Langford, it wouldn't have shocked me if Romeo just kind of like didn't escape the room and got <laughs> left behind. And the guys left, they were like, oh, we forgot where's Romeo. Romeo? Yeah. And eventually <laughs> they meet up with him later. He's like, yeah, I just got lost. Sorry. Yeah. That, just I, like, you know. That's totally understandable. <laughs> I, I can see that happening. Uh, yeah. Romeo Langford again is... Quick update. He is in Maine with the Maine Red Claws. They wrap up training camp today, November 7th. They start their season on Saturday on the road. Uh, they have a pretty intriguing roster. I'm uh, definitely open to turning this into a G League podcast from this point forward, but I don't think we'll do that. But either way, they'll start the season most likely on the road with Taco Fall, Tremont Waters, uh, Romeo Langford, and a couple other guys who were with the Celtics in training camp in Kaiser Gates, uh, Yante Maten. So they're going to be pretty entertaining. I think um, those games will be broadcast, so you can't watch at least their home games. But uh, the Celtics will have an entertaining G League team for the most part. Let's move into some other news and notes around the NBA. Your Bulls were able to hold on to a second-half lead last night. Do you want to go over the depressing – second half, mainly fourth quarter against the Los Angeles Lakers? Um, you know, I don't want to because I'd like to only speak positively of my Bulls. But, yeah, I guess. So, a very strong take I have. I think the Bulls are the best three-quarter team in the NBA. You're not going to find a team. I mean, they'll jump on you. Like, they'll look amazing through three quarters. Yeah. And then the last five minutes of a game, they'll look like the worst team you've I ever seen. I blame that on Boylan. Personally, and that as as a avid Bulls fan, long time <laughs> Bulls fan, uh, first it, time, long time. It was just so perfect for him. The fact that how bad they looked in the last five minutes of that that Lakers game, just be like, oh, I wouldn't have changed anything. Like, yeah, well, you should have well, changed everything. Yeah, you should have changed everything. Yeah. You blew a double digit lead going into the fourth quarter. Yeah, and it was nice to see them hold on 
to uh, a win the other night against the Hawks because the staple of the uh, Bulls so far this season have been, you know, be up by like 14, 15 at halftime, and just by blood. six. Yeah. I mean, but. If they could play the Hawks every night, they might be able to fix that problem. Right. That would be much better. A team that refuses to blow leads is the Phoenix Suns. My Phoenix Suns are 5-2. and two. Still, their only two losses are one-point losses to the Nuggets and Jazz. Respectively, they handed the Sixers their first loss the other night. Now, I was serious when I brought them up a couple episodes ago talking about that. I was all in on them. But I think, again, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs in right. the West. The West is really good, and everything will even out at some point. But they are a legitimately good basketball yeah. team. Like, they're entertaining. One thing, I, just to throw a Celtics tie on it, I've been shocked by is how well Baines has meshed He might be the group. best center in the NBA. It's he, crazy because when he got there, first of all, I didn't think he was going to stay there. Yeah. I thought that was a guy you take on, you unload somewhere else. He was going to get bought out. Right, yeah. sure, one of those things. Especially because you think about all of the, you know, finesse, high-volume guys they right. have on that team. But maybe that's all they needed all along, which is, you know, a gritty big man. He's been so good. He's averaging yeah. he's averaging 15 points, 6 rebounds, 3.6 assists. He's shooting 48% from three. He's a career 33% shooter from three. He's almost shooting 60% from the floor in 25 minutes a game. I mean, for those fantasy basketball players out there, he is like a no-brainer right now just because he packs the stat sheet. I, again... I didn't think he would last in Phoenix because the whole thing surrounding Baines was he wanted to go to a winner. Sure. And he wanted to, which is understandable. He's been on winning teams for the majority of his career besides his stint in Detroit. Um, but he, I, no one thought this was going to be a winning team. No. Guys like Kelly Oubre, I mean, they've, they've really, really impressed. Booker, without DeAndre, and Baines has stepped up really well. He might, he might Wally Pip DeAndre, and I don't know. Kelly Oubre, Ricky Rubio, they've been really, really good, so that's probably the most entertaining team in the West, in my opinion. Do you have any other notes around the NBA that you want to hit on before we go kind of back to Celtics to wrap up the show? Yeah, let's go back to Celtics. All right. What's, what's the deal with all these haircuts? I know you had some opinions because Carson's dreads are gone. Right. Shemi's early season updo is gone. Like, And obviously Jalen Brown began the season chopping his flat top so what's the deal here the the i'm not gonna lie the carson one stunned me i mean yeah. that just seems like that's part of it he looks like a different person right the yeah. shemmy one i could see shemmy who's a very we've seen a very thoughtful you know yeah smart guy him having like an actual reason being like it's making me like not as strong as i'd like to be right something weird like that my initial <laughs> my initial thought or my follow-up thought was Who's next? It might not be a haircut or just some weird, you know, hair thing. My right. biggest fear, we've seen him dabble it with it a couple times, when Tice goes through that weird early 2000s slim M &M, shady yeah, bleach yeah. blonde, yep. he needs to not do that. And things are going well for him. Like, he shouldn't change right. anything. Carson Edwards, things are going poorly for him. I think Romeo will benefit from the claws starting up big time because he seems like someone who could be peer pressured into cutting his hair yeah. like just being in the locker room and then looking at him being like well you got to do it next you know <laughs> yeah. we all have short hair now yeah. like what are you doing so i don't know who's next we know it won't be hayward robin will not let him get his hair cut right so uh, did you hear she packs his bags for road trips that's I, that's the, the least, least surprising it, thing ever. Yeah, not uh, a surprising thing at all. Not yeah. a great thing to have, like, get out there. Right. You probably don't want people knowing that. Yeah. Back to Carson's haircut real quick. Hey, yeah, I was really shocked because he looks dramatically different. Right. Um, but he said, and again, it, he's an honest kid, whatever, that's fine. He said he made a promise to his mom that once he got drafted, he was going to cut the dreads. Just say the dreads didn't have any buckets in them. Like, that's an easy yeah. thing that will get everyone to be like, I'm all in. I'm all in on your new haircut. Like, I'm in. Instead, people are like, well, I kind of miss the dreads. Like, I'm not crazy about it. Again, 13 points in his first game. Without the dreads, he was very, very much about, like, shooting yeah. that down. After He's like, it has nothing to do with the hair. No, and, and that's – that's uh it's a logical explanation we saw with swaggy p he, yeah one of his arms no tattoos strictly for buckets strictly for buckets strictly for buckets so yeah. fun, i mean fun that, fact fun fact about that when i was a freshman in college and i was trying to really get into sports writing i started a sports blog and i named it 
Strictly Bucket Sports after Nick Young, and he was the cover photo on the front page. Still active if you want to go up there. hasn't hasn't been much action in the last couple of years, but uh, I have a, a I'm a big time Swaggy P fan. Um, in terms of everything else going on with the Celtics, Hornets again tonight. Then they'll go to San Antonio um, tonight. Cantor comes back. Jalen Brown comes back. So it will be a bit of a different dynamic than the last few games. I know some Celtics fans are almost like anxious about that, which I don't understand. I, I guess I can understand why, because they've won, torn off five, sure. five wins in a row. But you should never argue with getting a, your full roster back. No, and I think it's important to get Brown back. Just like you said, um, they, were, they managed to make it through quite well, but they were tested with their limited depth. Yeah. And say what you want about Brown, uh, but you know having that guy who can just drive to the basket and get it, create his own shot. I mean that's gonna. And he was be really good points. before he, he got hurt. I mean he had a he had a tough first game because he had five fouls in the blink of an eye. But the next two games, I mean he was solid. He's averaging, I think, just over seventeen points a game. So he's right on that twenty point cusp, as well. And Cantor, against a team like the Hornets who's struggling in the front court. I mean. I'd almost put a grand on it that right. he's going to get a double bubble. Yeah. Right. Another thing with Brown, too, I think when you hear someone's out with an illness, yeah. you just kind of assume it's like the flu right. or something, they'll be back. So He's got the runs is, is what you've right. heard. Yeah. yeah, so it, one, it was weird that Brown m- missed so many games, and then we find out he was just like – Routinely getting these like discharges from his leg, like this yeah. was like so, it seemed like yeah, an abscess. Was, yeah, it sound, didn't seem like he was sick. More of like something was growing inside of him. Or right, something. it was literally inside of his leg that caused an infection, which led him to having a high fever. And it all yeah. started during warmups against the Bucks. I mean, not great. He said at shoot around this morning that he's feeling great and he's good to go. Again, he's listed as probable, but yeah, when I heard infection illness, not really what I was going for. Right. Um, also, Robert Williams and Daniel Tice were on the injury report. They should be good to go. Those are just lingering injuries. So you should have a full front court. And you mentioned shoot around, and you taught you mentioned putting a grand on uh, with Canner. Another <laughs> thing I'd put a grand on. I think we're going to see Smart's highest point total of the season tonight because he busted out the Versace robe. That was big time coming into shoot around this morning. He knows if you bust that out, you have to show up tonight. He wore it to shoot around. I think you're going to expect a huge night from Marcus Smart. What do you, realistically, what do you think Terry's going to finish with tonight? Because you know he's going to get his shots up. Yeah. And, it, again, a lot of it depends on that first shot. But this is his first game against the Celtics. He says he's still got love for the team. But you know there's going to be a little bit of right. a revenge game mentality. I, w- I honestly wouldn't be surprised if you saw high 20s, maybe even low 30s from yeah. Terry. With but 35 shots. that could be a wildly inefficient night. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I still think you're going to see a high volume of points. It's just a matter of how many shots it's going to take him to get there. Yeah, okay, that's fair. So we'll wrap it up there. Again, Hornets tonight at 8 o'clock. It's the TNT game, so a late start in Charlotte at the Spectrum Center. Celtics then wrap up that three-game road trip against the Spurs in San Antonio at 5 o'clock on Saturday. And then two more games before uh, we'll figure out next week. Next week is a weird schedule for us, so we'll figure out when we're going to throw up that next episode. But... Monday, Mavericks, Wednesday, Wizards, both at TD Garden. And we will recap those games and anything else in the world of Celtics when we get together next week. 